I thought I'd make things slightly more in line with application advice this week, so today we're going to run through a thought experiment that was used when I was applying for PPE. If you don't like PPE, then this is still going to be partly relevant for you, because the thought experiment is all about challenging how you think, and ultimately how you think is what's important. In case you've heard of it before, I'm going to be running through a version of The Prisoner's Dilemma. So you can either skip to the end of this video, or listen and count it as a bit of revision. So for those of you who have no idea what The Prisoner's Dilemma is, I'm going to propose a scenario to you, with some basic assumptions. I want you guys to reason what is the best strategy for each player in the scenario to maximise their personal benefit. Let's begin. There are two individuals, a man and a woman. We'll call the man Matt M and we will call the woman Rebecca. Now these two individuals have not been acting very virtuously because they have been arrested for what appears to be robbery. However the police do not have enough evidence to convict these two individuals of the crime of robbery but they do have sufficient evidence to convict them of trespassing. The police want to convict them what they're pretty sure is robbery so they want a confession out of the two prisoners. To get this confession from the two prisoners they're going to propose each of them the same deal. The police officer goes up to Matt and says if both of you stay completely silent we're going to give you two years in prison and convict you for the crime of trespassing which we do have sufficient evidence to convict you of but not the robbery. However, if you confess and betray your partner and your partner stays silent, then well, you can go off scot-free and your partner will have to deal with 10 years imprisonment. However, if both of you confess to your crimes, then we'll punish you both equally, giving you five years imprisonment each. The exact same offer is proposed to Rebecca. Before going into what game theory would propose to be the optimum strategy for both players to play, I'm going to just outline some assumptions that were made within this dilemma. Number one, Matt and Rebecca are both rational beings, that is, they primarily are concerned with their own self-interest. They want the best possible outcome for themselves. They do not care about the other person. Number two, there are literally no repercussions for either person in this game when they eventually go out into the outside world. Rebecca is not going to hunt down Matt for betraying her in this prisoner scenario. And number three, probably one of the most important assumptions of this model, is that neither of them, Rebecca nor Matt, can communicate with each other to cooperate on a strategy that will work in both of their interests. I want to give you guys a go at figuring out what you think the best possible strategy is for each of the players, Rebecca and Matt. So why don't you take the information that I proposed earlier and as a hint, drop a table of the possible outcomes. Remember that each player is trying to choose the outcome that is in their own best interests. And while you pause the video and think about this, I will pull a funny face. Okay, that seems as though it's probably long enough for you guys to have thought that through, so let's draw up a table. Now your table probably looks something like this. In the rows, you've got Matt's possible options of confessing or staying silent, and in the columns, you've got Rebecca's possible options of confessing or staying silent. Just to explain that a bit further, the numbers represent the amount of time that an individual will be staying in prison if they go for a particular option. The first number that you see is the option that Matt does because he is player one in this scenario and the second option is the outcome for Rebecca, she's player two in this scenario. To reach the conclusion of the best possible strategy, let us assume that I am Matt. If I assume as Matt that Rebecca will stay silent, it is in my best interest to confess to Rebecca's crime because that will result in me having served absolutely no time in prison and it will result in Rebecca having to serve 10 years in prison. However, if I also chose to stay silent in this scenario, then I would be serving two years imprisonment, which is obviously worse than spending no years in prison. If I then assume that Rebecca confessed as opposed to staying silent, then I'd much rather also confess because then I'd only have to spend five years in prison as opposed to a possible 10 if I stay silent and she grasses on me. As the problem is symmetrical, that is, the best possible option for one player holds true for the other player, confessing is also the best option for Rebecca regardless of what Matt chooses. This is because Rebecca will play in exactly the same way as Matt because she is also anticipating what options he will take. Now does something strike you as odd that the best possible option for both players is the one in which they both confess? The one in which that they're both serving five years in prison? I hope it does, because upon just an initial observation, you can see that the best possible option for them is the one where they spend only two years in prison, which is where they both, you know, stay silent. However, because of our assumption that both players were rational, it's the temptation to betray the other person to serve their own best interests, of the potential of serving absolutely no years in prison, that leads them to conclude that the best strategy for them to play is the one in which they both confess. But this is obviously a worst case scenario than the one in which they both stay silent and they only have to serve two years in prison. Now why am I bringing this up? Well, the first reason is because I just want to warm up your brain a bit, and because I wanted to show you how game theory can be applied to numerous different scenarios and numerous different disciplines. 
Game theory is applied to inform economic models, it's also used in philosophy and in international relations, and of course it is used to help you figure out what the best move is when playing Eclipse, for example, which is a pretty epic board game. This is where I link everything together and how it's relevant to me, because this week I have been revising international relations. Specifically, I've been looking at the theoretical branch of liberalism, which looks at the way in which agents, or states, interact with one another within the international system. With international theory, they try to anticipate the way in which states are going to behave and to reason the motives behind the actions of states. Liberalism believes that we can overcome these self-help, self-interest instincts that we have inside of us that the realist theory advocates uh, and replace that with cooperation to bring about an outcome that is more advantageous to our interests and the overall interests of promoting peace. One of the ways in which states do this is through institutions, for example the United Nations. States enter the United Nations and agree to abide by certain rules to promote the collective good. For instance, a declaration of human rights within the United Nations, all states are agreeing that these rights are ones that we're going to uphold in the international system. However, there's always a risk that some states might cheat. This prospect of cheating would deter states from wanting to join those institutions in the first place, because their good intentions have been betrayed and this wouldn't serve their own personal self-interest. This is where the prisoner's dilemma comes in, but with just a small little twist. Instead of playing the game just once, as was in the previous example, you play the game for an uncertain amount of time. This is meant to reflect the situation that states are in because they don't know when their state is going to cease to exist. It has been reasoned that the best strategy for the states in this situation is to play a tit-for-tat strategy. I won't go into the details for the sake of time and I'll add some more details down in the description, however, in essence, it involves that one player will always cooperate unless the other player betrays them. This is because cooperation, on the whole, is better for them, it promotes their own personal interests and it would also promote the interests of the other state. However, if the other state betrays them to try and gain some sort of edge over the other player who is cooperating with them, then the next move of the person who has been betrayed will be to betray that person to teach them that they can't get away with this. This is meant to show them that if you betray this person, well, we're going to betray you and that's not the best outcome because if we had been cooperating for the long run, it's going to be to our mutual benefit. For instance, if you form economic ties between states to promote your own economic prosperity, or alternatively, you could betray the other state and pursue military conquest, which will result in you having to pay the blood price to pursue this interest that ultimately isn't really going to pay off in the long run because number one, you don't really have the trust of other states, and number two, it requires a lot of resources uh, to be able to perform military action. Just to point out one flaw in this model, the tip for tap strategy might not be very effective in how to act as a state because if you are betrayed by the state that you're cooperating with, the extent of their betrayal might be pretty extreme. For instance, they might nuke you, which means that you don't really have the opportunity in all likelihood to retaliate. Does this make the tip for tap strategy fall apart? And on that cliffhanger, I'm going to end the video there. I'm going to leave that for you guys to think about. Ultimately, thinking independently and thinking for yourself and criticising the model for all of its assumptions, whether they are reflective of the real world or not, or whether you can think of better strategies, that's basically what it's like to be interviewed at Oxford and to do a degree at Oxford. I have some links in the description for you so you can get some more information about this brief introduction to game theory. And next week I'm going to give you guys a bit of an insight into what I'm doing to actually revise um, and hopefully there'll be some tips in there that you guys will also find useful. So, see you on Sunday subscribers. Welcome to the end screen! The Oxford Design Competition ends at midnight tomorrow, that is Monday, so get your entries in as soon as possible. Here is a video with all of the information that you need if you would like to enter. Also, as a sort of Easter egg, Rebecca and Matt M are actually real people. Uh, they are top fans to this channel, so I thought I'd give you both a shout out. Uh, sorry for accusing you of criminal activity. Um, I'll be including top fans randomly in videos. Top fans are decided by people who interact the most with the content on this channel, so if you regularly comment, like, or share the videos, then you'll be sure to feature in a video soon enough. I've also shouted out to all my top fans, but I thought I'd ask all of you. We are fast approaching 2,000 subscribers on this channel, and I was wondering if there's anything you would like me to make, collaborate with, or challenges you would like me to perform uh, to celebrate the fact that we have reached the 2,000 subscriber milestone. Have a fantastic week, and DFTVA. Blah. Oh, I can't believe I didn't say that right. Blah. 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 I was trying to say blood. And playing the blood. Blah. I didn't, couldn't do it again.